After reviewing The Prestige earlier this month, I can't really not review The Illusionist, can I? These two films are examples of a peculiar phenomenon that happens sometimes in Hollywood, known as twin films. Two films that are very similar to each other, that are released around the same time by different studios. Examples of this include Deep Impact and Armageddon. I've already done a video comparing those two. Tombstone and Wyatt Earp. Ants and A Bug's Life, Mission to Mars and Red Planet, Finding Nemo and Shark Tale, Capote and Infamous, Snow White and The Huntsman and Mirror Mirror, to name but a few. The Prestige and The Illusionist both came out in 2006, and they both tell the tale of stage magic in the late 19th century. They're both told, mostly in flashbacks, and they both contain a major twist at the end. The Prestige has a more complex narrative structure, whereas The Illusionist is told in a more conventional fashion. The Prestige is probably the stronger film, but there's really very little in it, in my opinion. Aside from their surface-level story similarities in terms of genre and setting, the films are actually very different when you get into it. The Prestige is a more cerebral puzzle box film and a psychological thriller, whereas The Illusionist is, at its core, a romance with mystery elements to it. Before I go very much further, please go ahead and watch this film before watching the rest of this video. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel by clicking the button below and give me a thumbs up if you can, it's very much appreciated. Okay, so The Illusionist takes place in Vienna during the time of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Stage magician Edward Abramovich, known as Eisenheim, played by Edward Norton, is arrested during a performance where he attempts to conjure the spirit of a dead woman on stage. Now, at this point of the film, we don't see the woman's face. The arrest is made by Paul Giamatti's character, Chief Inspector Walter Uhl. He reports to the Crown Prince, Leopold, the heir to the throne, who wants Eisenheim discredited. Uhl proceeds to give us an account of Eisenheim's life, or should I say Edward, and how, when he was a boy, he became a magician, a story shrouded in mystery and myth. Young Edward met Duchess Sophie, and the two soon fell in love, but he was forbidden to see her because she was aristocracy, and he was from a peasant background. So they had to be together in secret, they planned to run off together. One evening, they're found. She asks him to make them disappear, but he can't. She's taken from him, seemingly forever. So young Edward leaves and travels the world. That's when he changed his name to Eisenheim and began performing magic in public. He returned to Vienna 15 years later. His tricks are extremely impressive. He appears to slow down the flow of time, making an orange fall slower than it should, and even making an orange tree grow at incredible speed. Edward Norton is just fantastic in this role, extremely believable and presenting an intensity, a mystery, and yet a real humanity to the character of Eisenheim. Likewise, Paul Giamatti is truly brilliant as Uhl, subtly portraying his discomfort and conflicted feelings at having to apprehend Eisenheim a man he quite likes, while still having to remain loyal to Leopold. Uhl sympathises with Edward because they both come from a similar peasant background. But ultimately, Uhl is compromised. During one of Eisenheim's performances, he brings a woman on stage. It's Sophie, as an adult, played by Jessica Biel. The trick involves the illusion of making it appear that Sophie's reflection has been killed, and her spirit floats away into the ether. Leopold is very impressed and invites Eisenheim to do a private performance at his castle. He's played by Rufus Sewell, and the character is an arrogant, egotistic killjoy who feels intimidated by Eisenheim's tricks. He hates not knowing how the magic is done, and he tries desperately to figure it all out. Eisenheim remains humble about the whole affair, however. So Sophie and Eisenheim, or should I say Edward, meet in secret and become reacquainted. She's due to marry Leopold, and she feels very shackled to the monarchical system she lives in. She admires Edward for escaping it. Uhl takes Edward aside and warns him to stay away from Sophie. It's not long before Sophie and Edward rekindle their romance, 
and it's also not long before the Eisenheim show is shut down. Leopold becomes increasingly unstable and angry with Sophie, even violent. She tells him she won't marry him, and she leaves and he chases after her. It appears as if she's been murdered by him while trying to escape on horseback. Edward finds her body floating in a lake. He's devastated. A doctor confirms she died by bleeding to death from a wound on her throat, possibly a knife or a sword. In the folds of her dress, they also find a small gemstone, like the ones found in Leopold's sword. Hmm. Edward eventually opens his own theater and develops a new Eisenheim show where he communicates on stage with the spirits from beyond the grave. The authorities come up with a crude explanation of how the trick is being done using a projector. Edward is beginning to excite a new spiritual movement in the city, and Leopold feels threatened and wants him arrested for fraud. Uhl brings him in for questioning. Edward is still convinced that Leopold killed Sophie. He tells a supportive crowd that everything he's done is an illusion and that people should go home. In his latest show, Edward makes Sophie's ghost appear on stage. Uhl advises him not to do this again, but he does in his very next show. Sophie gives enough information to the crowd to seriously point the finger for her death at Leopold. But Uhl has Edward arrested for disturbing public order and making threats against the Empire. And the flashback has now concluded. We've caught up with the start of the film. But when he tries to lay a hand on Edward, he sees that he is also an illusion, much like a ghost. He's not really sitting in the chair at all. He disappears. Uhl finally stands up to Leopold, knowing that he ultimately wants to seize control of the throne. He threatens Uhl with a gun, but police arrive to arrest him. He ultimately shoots himself, rather than being arrested. Uhl leaves the palace and a boy gives him a letter, which he says is from Eisenheim. It contains the secret of the orange tree trick. Edward is in disguise and escapes on a train. Uhl eventually figures out what's really been happening. Edward and Sophie faked her death and pinned it on Leopold, so that they could be together. Even the doctor was a plant. They have quite literally, and finally, disappeared at last. The Illusionist is a very enjoyable film with terrific performances and it's extremely well directed and written by Neil Berger. Incidentally, the film is loosely based on the short story Eisenheim the Illusionist by Stephen Milhauser. While The Prestige spends much time unpacking the techniques of magicians and their method, even the Tesla duplication machine is less magic and more unexplained science and technology, The Illusionist by comparison doesn't try to get into the nitty gritty of how every trick is done. The understanding is that it's an illusion and it doesn't all require an explanation. The film has therefore more of a fantasy feel about it when compared to the more cerebral and technical approach of The Prestige. So because of this, and the fact that The Illusionist is fundamentally a love story, I think it has much more heart than The Prestige. So in that respect, I think The Illusionist is the easier watch of the two films, though they are both superbly crafted. When you get right down to it, The Illusionist is a wonderful story that's really well told. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you very much for watching. Take care, and I'll see you next time. The Dave Cullen Show is made possible by you, my generous subscribers. If you'd like to support my work, head on over to my subscribe star linked below in the description box. And for a pledge of as little as $1 per month, you can help to keep the show going. I'm also doing one-to-one -one monthly subscriber chats. Thanks again. Take care.